Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. And what a week, eh? We had two massive launches and two catastrophic failures to go with them. Despite this, SpaceX did nail the catch of Booster 14 and Blue Origin achieved orbit on their very first attempt, which is an impressive feat in itself. We also saw two successful outings of Falcon 9 and one Long March 2D. And over at Kennedy, NASA continued making progress with Artemis, with continued stacking of the SRBs for Artemis 2. And on the International Space Station, Nick Haig and Sonny Williams conducted the first spacewalk of the year. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. The honour of biggest space story of the week is probably jointly shared with SpaceX's Starship Flight 7 and Blue Origin's New Glenn 1. Starting with the former, at this point I'm sure nobody here watching is unaware of the events that transpired, but the flight started out with roaring success, lifting off the pad with all 33 Raptor engines running on Thursday. All engines running is something we'd hope to expect at this stage, but one of the outer engines was Raptor serial number 314, which had previously supported Booster 12 during Flight 5, making this the first time a Raptor engine has been reflown on Super Heavy, giving SpaceX critical insight into how a reused Raptor might perform, something extremely important given that the primary goal of Starship is full reusability. That's not to say there were zero issues with the engines during flight, but more on that later. The vehicle proceeded nominally, blasting through Max Q and making it successfully to main engine cutoff. We then saw successful hot staging as Ship 33 ignited its six Raptor engines and separated from Super Heavy, whereupon the latter began its return to base. At this stage, we weren't sure if SpaceX would be go for catch or not, but later on we did indeed get the call out that all systems were go for booster catch. At around 2 minutes and 50 seconds into the flight, we saw ignition of the central three Raptor engines, and attempted light of the surrounding 10, but one of them failed. So we can assume that this engine was kaput, right? Well, let's continue. The whole point of this burn was to boost Super Heavy back towards the launch tower, which was where the tension really started to ramp up. While SpaceX have demonstrated capability of performing tower catches once before, this is still really precarious stuff, considering what the potential consequences are of the booster missing the tower and hitting any of the ground support infrastructure. And at this stage, we knew SpaceX would go for catch, so we all waited with bated breath for the moment. And then we had engine startup. Like the boost back burn, this is done with the central three Raptors and the surrounding 10, with the booster cutting back to just the center ones for the final touchdown. And look at that, the engine that previously failed to ignite during boost back appeared to be back in action. Albeit only briefly, the 13 engine phase of the landing burn isn't all that long, and then we were down to just the central three as the booster came in towards the catch arms. I don't know if it was just me, but it looked really precarious on the stream. I guess it probably always will, given the craziness of this manoeuvre. Anyway, yes, the long and short of it is that SpaceX nailed the catch on their second ever attempt, which is great, but also, yeah, not really a lot of wiggle room to mess these up, which is why SpaceX didn't attempt to catch on Flight 6, since systems weren't 100% go for a catch attempt due to communications issues with the tower. Now, while the booster catch was a success, one of the major focal points of Flight 7 was the Starship. This was Ship 33, which was the first ever Block 2 variant of Starship, sporting a number of upgrades. For starters, you can probably tell that Ship 33 has much smaller forward flaps than its predecessors, located more leeward and close to the nose cone's tip, to reduce their exposure to the heat of re-entry while also simplifying their underlying mechanisms and heat shielding. Speaking of the heat shield, Ship 33 sported SpaceX's latest generation tiles and it had a backup layer to help protect it from tile loss or damage. It also had 25% more propellant capacity, evidenced by just how high the frost lines extended up its fuselage. And the lines that feed the engines have been upgraded as well, with vacuum jacketing of the feed lines and an upgraded avionics module to control the vehicle valves and reading sensors, cumulatively enhancing the vehicle's performance and capacity. But this was all for naught, as we know, as unfortunately, Ship 33 didn't make it very far. While the stream was still focused on the caught booster, the ship's engine diagram suddenly showed loss of one of the central raptors, followed by loss of another, then one of the vacuum raptors, 
then another, then the third and final central engine, and then complete loss of ship telemetry altogether. Our final brief view of the ship before the feed cut out featured one of the aft flaps, and looking here, we can see what appears to be flames, which I don't think are supposed to be there somehow. <laughs> Elon later confirmed that the preliminary investigations into the anomaly appeared to indicate that this was secondary to an oxygen and methane leak in the cavity above the ship engine firewall that built up enough pressure to exceed the capacity of the vents. One of the first steps SpaceX will do to prevent this in future flights, aside from obviously checking more carefully for leaks, is to add fire suppression systems to that part of the vehicle and probably increase the vent area as well. This can apparently be implemented fairly quickly, given Elon expressed hope that Flight 8 should still be okay to go ahead in February, but we'll have to wait and see what the outcome of any mishap investigation will be. The ship did at least reach space, with the last telemetry readout showing an altitude of 146 kilometers, but it's a real shame we didn't get to see re-entry and another successful flip to vertical landing burn over the ocean. NASA was also hoping to capture images of the ship's re-entry and peak heating from a specially equipped Gulfstream 5 aircraft, but of course this never happened either. Another thing that didn't happen was another test of a Raptor engine relight in space and deployment of the payload. The ship was carrying 10 simulated Starlink satellites which would have been ejected from the ship's Pez dispenser system and then re-enter over the Indian Ocean, which would have been the first time a Starship has deployed payload in space. One thing we did see was this. People witnessed the vehicle exploding over Turks and Caicos Islands. This user managed to capture video of the exact moment of the explosion. What followed was a dramatic debris field shooting across the sky, which people were very quick to film and share online, giving us at home some amazing views of the catastrophic failure. The explosion prompted regional airspace closures that ended up lasting over an hour, and it also triggered an FAA-required mishap investigation, which is reasonable. <laughs> SpaceX issued a statement confirming that the ship remained within its designated launch corridor, and any surviving pieces of debris would have fallen within the designated hazard area. So, all in all, a bittersweet launch. The upsides were, of course, witnessing a booster catch for the second time, and because Ship 33 had more fuel capacity than its predecessors, Starship once again became the heaviest flying object ever built, weighing approximately 5,000 tons at liftoff. And although Ship 33 didn't survive, this was the first of its kind, though one would think we shouldn't be seeing anomalies like this seven flights in. So, what does all this mean for Flight 8? Well, as mentioned, Elon Musk has stated that the Ship 33 mishap shouldn't have too big of an impact on things and that a February launch date could still be possible. The expected vehicles to fly on this test will be Ship 34 and Booster 15, and while previously it's been hinted that this flight will see the first attempt of a ship catch, this is now extremely unlikely given the failure of Ship 33 on Flight 7. Where are the Flight 8 vehicles right now? Well, Booster 15 underwent cryo testing on the 29th of December last year, while Ship 34 was moved to the Massey's test site last Wednesday, where SpaceX conducted two rounds of cryo proofing on the 17th and 18th of January. Starship has a long way to go before it fully replaces SpaceX's Falcon class of rocket, which saw two outings last week. Tuesday saw a Falcon 9 launch the Transporter 12 mission from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The Transporter missions are SpaceX's dedicated small sats rideshare missions that carry a large number of payloads. In the case of Transporter 12, the rocket carried 131 payloads, including CubeSats, Microsats, and orbital transfer vehicles carrying 30 of those payloads, 14 of which will be deployed at a later time, bringing the total number of rideshare payloads to orbit launched by SpaceX to over 1,100. This was this first stage booster's second flight, and no drone ships were needed for this mission. Transport missions always aim to make a return to launch site landing, and this was no exception, with the booster making successful touchdown on landing zone 4. On Wednesday, we saw the 100th ever launch of Falcon from Launchpad 39A at Cape Canaveral, carrying not one, but two lunar landers. The first of which was Blue Ghost M1, designed by Firefly Aerospace, which is now en route to the moon, a journey expected to take 45 days. Blue Ghost M1 is the first of Firefly's Blue Ghost class of robotic lunar landers, which will carry small payloads to the surface of the moon. This particular mission was commissioned by NASA for Firefly to deliver a suite of science investigations and technology demonstrators to the moon, and the lander is planned to land at Mary Crisium, a 500 km wide basin visible from Earth, and following touchdown, the lander will operate its payloads for a complete lunar day, which is about the same as two Earth weeks. 
Following payload operations, the lander will capture lunar sunset imagery and provide data on how the lunar regolith reacts to solar influences during lunar dusk conditions. It'll continue to operate several hours into the lunar night. The other lunar lander on board Falcon 9 was iSpace's second attempt at a lunar landing. Their first lunar lander was launched in December 2022, but the landing attempt failed when the onboard computer wrongly assumed the radar altimeter was faulty, ignoring its data, which resulted in the lander running out of fuel and plummeting to the surface and you know, breaking. <laughs> Hopefully things go better for them this time. This is the Hakuto R Mission 2, and it has the same objectives as Mission 1, to serve as a technology demonstrator with the final goal of providing reliable transportation and data services to the moon. Its journey to the moon will last around five months and upon landing it will deploy a micro rover which will form an in situ resource utilization demonstration. Here's hoping the landing for both Blue Ghost and Hakuto R will be as successful as the Falcon 9's first stage which successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship following stage separation completing this particular booster's fifth overall mission. Oh I I hope that bird was okay. <sighs> It's crazy that it's been almost 10 years since the first successful Falcon 9 landing, and yet nobody else has an operational reusable orbital class rocket yet. Until last week, that is. Yes, I'm of course talking about the maiden launch of Blue Origin's new Glenn. On its surface, it's a very similar rocket to Falcon 9 in that it's a single stack with a recoverable first stage, which Blue Origin say is designed for a minimum of 25 flights. However, it's much more capable than Falcon 9. Standing 98 meters tall and 7 meters wide, it's able to carry roughly double the payload mass, making it closer in performance to Falcon Heavy, though Falcon Heavy can carry around 20,000 kilograms to orbit more. That being said, New Glenn works out more efficient, considering Falcon Heavy expends its core, and New Glenn's fairing is much larger, meaning it can carry physically bigger payloads than Falcon Heavy can. And considering that since its debut in 2018, we've only had 11 Falcon Heavy launches in total, 10 if you discount the test flight, so there doesn't seem to be an enormous demand for its master orbit capability. Anyway, getting sidetracked, on Thursday we watched as the countdown ticked to zero and liftoff. Very, very slow liftoff, but liftoff nonetheless. Considering the fact that the payload on this launch was the tiny blue ring spacecraft, I wonder if this low thrust weight ratio was just Blue Origin not throttling the seven BE-4 engines to maximum performance for the first flight. Anyway, the rocket cleared the pad successfully and breezed through Max-Q as well. It made its main engine cutoff and second stage ignition of the two BE-3U engines successfully, and the upper stage carried the payload to orbit on the very first launch attempt, which is a fantastic achievement for Blue Origin. And this also means that New Glenn reached orbit before Starship, which is still only ever launched on suborbital flights, by choice. However, the main event we were hoping to see was a hopefully successful landing of the first stage booster. Unfortunately, we're a little bit spoiled by SpaceX's streams at this point, as there weren't really any good onboard views, or any views at all for that matter. And you know, while I'm at it, Imperial units, guys, really? If you're going to show Imperial, then at least also show Metric, as that's the standard for spaceflight streams, and I think even American viewers watching are probably more used to seeing space things in Metric, and the callouts guy was using Metric when he wasn't being drowned out by the hosts as well. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, the landing was not to be. We got a few frames of what looked like engine ignition and then loss of telemetry, with the final readings before cutoff showing the stage travelling at Mach 5.5 at an altitude of 25.7 kilometers. This has triggered an FAA mishap investigation, which will be led by Blue Origin, and this will need to be completed and reviewed by the FAA before New Glenn will be granted a launch license for a second flight. While disappointing we didn't see a booster landing, reaching orbit on the first attempt is a massive achievement, and it certainly took SpaceX a number of attempts to successfully land both Falcon 9 and Starship's first stages. As for the payload on this mission, it was Blue Origin's Blue Ring spacecraft platform designed to facilitate spacecraft operations, aiming to offer capabilities like satellite refueling, transportation, and hosting, shown here in this animation that Blue Origin shared in Potato Quality. <laughs> Blue Origin confirmed that Blue Ring has been placed into its desired orbit with an apogee of 19,300 kilometers and perigee of 2,400 kilometers with a 30 degree inclination with a less than 1% deviation from its exact orbital injection target. 
Another rocket that reached orbit on its first attempt was NASA's Space Launch System, and work is proceeding well for its second launch that'll carry astronauts to lunar orbit. These photos were taken last Tuesday, showing engineers and technicians transferring the right center segment with the NASA Worm logo of one of the solid rocket motors into the vehicle assembly building for stacking. Together, the two side boosters provide over 75% of the total SLS thrust. Last week saw the first full moon of 2025, something made extra special by the fact it also blocked Mars for about an hour last Monday, something called lunar occultation. This is a rare event and happened just as Mars reached its closest point to Earth since December 2022. On Thursday, NASA astronauts Nick Haig and Sonny Williams conducted the 273rd Human EVA, entering the vacuum of space at the International Space Station in order to swap out a rate gyro assembly, something used for maintaining the ship's orientation, apply patches to repair damaged sections of an X-ray telescope, and replace a reflector device that aids in providing navigational data for one of the international docking adapters. They also checked connector tools and access areas that will be used for future maintenance work on the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. This was Nick Haig's fourth spacewalk and Sonny Williams' eighth. Over in China, a Long March 2D carried three satellites to orbit last Friday from the Jiu Chuen Satellite Launch Center, one of them being an Earth observation satellite developed and operated by the National Space Agency of Pakistan, a remote sensing satellite developed by Galaxy Aerospace designed to study the Earth's upper atmosphere, and a CubeSat operated by G-Space for oceanography research. The first stage of the rocket was fitted with grid fins to help control its descent and avoid it hitting populated areas, which is better late than never. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week. I can off the year by visiting one of my favourite missions. I flew a space station submarine through the upper atmosphere of Joule and also deployed a remote science probe into the depths of the gas giant, never to return. The last time I did this I wasn't making content in 4K and I had no visual mods installed, so I felt it was a mission that was well overdue a remaster, and I think it turned out really well. If you've not seen it yet then check it out by one of those cards on screen. The other one is definitely worth looking at too, and massive thank you if your name is on the right hand side there. It's your generous contributions to this channel that make all of this content possible, so sincerest thanks if you are there. If you'd like to sign up then you can click the link in the description, but yeah, that's the end of today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed the flight, and I'll catch you in the next one.